welcome, welcome, ladies and gentlemen. This is the sixth annual meeting of AIB, and we are arranging this special seminar on cross-border connectivity as part of our annual function. Um, we have a very distinguished uh, speakers, but before that, I would like to give you some background about this seminar. You know, when the AIB was started in 2016, the main objective was to promote infrastructure connectivity in Asia. And the second objective is to promote regional cooperation and to enlist the partnership with various multilateral development corporation as well as bilateral corporations so that we can easily achieve our objective of sustainable economic development in Asia. So part of our objective was to promote infrastructure connectivity in Asia. But it is a very, very challenging uh, uh, job today. Challenges because of various activities. Number one, climate change is posing a big problem. Number two, COVID-19, the pandemic is creating a big problem. Number three, there are geological barriers, which is there from the beginning. Four, there are political barriers. I'm not going to discuss about political, but there are political barriers. Number five, there are barriers, there are problems in creating viable quality projects. So how to overcome all these barriers? Uh, these climate barriers, you know, we have seen that this year, because of the wind is not there, the England was facing problem. There was a coal shortage and uh, energy shortage, and we are not able to transmit energy from one region to another region because there was no connectivity. So these are some of the problem for which we need the cooperation from country to country, region to region. So today we can discuss some of the some of these uh, problems, how we can overcome this problem. After pandemic, the economic activity shoot up. We are not able to find containers which was uh, available for 1500, now it is available for 20,000. How to, how to overcome sub this kind of problem? If there is a connectivity, proper connectivity, we can easily move goods and services quickly. Connectivity is not just for road or port or airport. Connectivity is also needed for transmission of electricity. Nowadays in the modern day technology, connectivity is needed for internet connectivity. So all these things we need to address for a proper balanced economic development in region, within region, and among the region. So for this, connectivity is very important. Today, we have distinguished panelists from various uh, walk of life. We have, we have Ms. Fatima Esmin. She is the Secretary, Economic Relations Division in Ministry of Finance, uh, Bangladesh. Uh, uh, Ms. Fatima is the, is the first woman secretary in Bangladesh. We are very happy to receive her. And uh, on behalf of AIB, I thank you for participating uh, in this uh, program. I think Ms. Fatima is very active uh, in, in taking care of the projects from AIB. She gives a lot of pro projects. She also reviews periodically. So it is, it is really a, a, a pleasure for us to have uh, Her Excellency Ms. Fatima Esmin. Second, we have Sishin Chen. Sishin Chen has experience in all the multilateral development organization. He worked as executive director in World Bank. He worked as the director in AIB, director in NDB. He has extensive knowledge uh, uh, and experience in government of People's Republic of China. Now he is vice president in ADB. So he brings a rich experience from various multilateral development organizations. We have Mr. Mr. Martin Reiser. He's the country director from World Bank. He's, he, uh, he's located in Beijing, country director for China. He is working very closely with the government of China and people of China to create relationship between MDB and China. He's also country director in charge of Mongolia. He also brings a lot of knowledge because he's, uh, he's also in charge of Korea, South Korea. So through innovation and technology, which is taking place in China and South Korea, he is a knowledge transfer agent. He's working from China. He has a, he has a distinguished career in EBRD, he, where he was in charge of country strategy. And he joined World Bank in the year 2003. And he worked in various countries, like important countries, like Turkey uh, and Belarus, uh, Mal Moldova, Ukraine, and now China. So he brings extensive experience from the different countries and uh, uh, of this uh, region. Uh, next is Mr. Wong. He's the chief executive officer. Like Mr. Chen, he also has extensive experience in World Bank, in the International uh, Fund for Agriculture Development. 
He also involved in NDB and he, he has a rich experience in the government of China in the Ministry of Finance. So we have people who have experience with government, who have experience with uh, international organization like uh, IFAD, World Bank, ADB, EBRD, etc. So this, this is a very distinguished panel. I don't want to waste much of my time. I would like to uh, go to Her Excellency, Ms. Fatima Yasmin. Ms. Fatima, you are the secretary uh, in the Ministry of Finance with very prestigious post in government of Bangladesh. Bangladesh is growing very fast. In the last 10 years, you have grown consistently more than 6%. However, you are surrounded by the big brother India on all the side and also Myanmar. Of course, you have you have access to the Bay of Bengal Sea, but that access is not that good because it's a marsh land. It's a very rough sea. So how do you think connectivity with your neighbor and the neighboring countries, whether it will improve the, your trade and economic development and what are the constraints for this connectivity? We'll be grateful if you could throw some light on, this, uh, on these issues. Uh, thank you, Dr. Pandian. Uh if I understand your uh, question correctly, that means my uh, first question will be something like whether uh, 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 the connectivity will contribute to our development. And the second one is what are the challenges yes. of having CBC? Okay. No Thank, problem. You. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Pandian. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, Assalamu alaikum and very good morning from Bangladesh. It is indeed my privilege and pleasure to speak before this August gathering at the sixth annual meeting of AIIB. Uh, I think this event is highly timely and is taking place at the time when we need closer and more effective regional cooperation in the world decimated by the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, I, 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 for, I forgot to thank you, Dr. Pandian, for your kind introduction. Okay. Let me start uh, with the backdrop of the economy of Bangladesh. Uh, 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 Dr. Pandian has mentioned a little bit of uh, about the progress. Over the last 12 years, Bangladesh has made significant progress in all socio-economic indicators under the prudent leadership, prudent and visionary leadership of our honorable Prime Minister, Her Excellency Sheikh Hasina. Before the onslaught of pandemic, Bangladesh was one of the fastest growing economy in the Asia. Our growth rate was 8.1% in fiscal year 2019. The COVID pandemic has hit us tremendously as many uh, other nations. However, despite the challenge, growth rate has remained in the positive trajectory. The economic growth that Bangladesh experienced in recent years has been contributed by the numerous factors like conducive policy support, improving essential infrastructure, widened inclusion of women in the workforce. While the domestic economy grew consistently, it became increasingly integrated with the global economy. And this integration is desirable for both the consumers and the entrepreneurs. The benefit of integrated markets come in form of efficient consumption and greater market access. This ensures that the comparative advantage existing in different markets result into the production and consumption of the most efficient goods and services across all the integrated regions. Therefore, we believe that integration of the market is essential for sustainable economic development and hence cost broader connectivity should be strengthened. Uh, the cross border connectivity means that if one country has a resource in plenty, its neighbors can have the option to enjoy it through a sharing mechanism. For example, if one of the neighbors has surplus electricity, we can explore whether it can be shared through the regional grid. If a neighbor has a surplus gas, 
we can plan to share it with other through the pipeline. The cross-border connectivity is therefore without a doubt very important and essential for a country and for a region that country belongs to. Uh, let me uh, um, um, let me um, share with you the location of Bangladesh. It appears that big markets in the East and the West should ideally be connected through this Delta. According to World Bank data in 2019, exports, exports by five major Asian countries lying on the East and the West of Bangladesh, namely India, China, Japan, South Korea, and Singapore comprise more than 21% of the global export. In the same time, there are five these five countries also imported more than 21% of total global imports and had about one third of the total world GDP. This means the countries can benefit a lot through uh, CBC for further growth and development. In South Asia, the inter-regional trade is about 5%, while it is over 25% in ASEAN. So it indicates that we have untapped uh, potentials to explore, and we can certainly make a big difference through CBC for Bangladesh, in which about 2 million people graduate every year from the low to middle income group cross-border connectivity surely offers fresh opportunity for the country. Uh, I, I just wanted to elaborate a little bit more if time permits, Dr. Pandyan. Yes, please go. Uh, um, the strength of Bangladesh, we have a pool of human resources who are hardworking and intelligent. The entrepreneurs, for example, the ready-made garment sector showed that they have the resilience to overcoming challenges, uh, overcoming challenging environment. And the government is keen to create business and investment friendly environment. These potentials can be fully realized if we can fully reap the benefits of the, uh, of the regional trade investment uh, through CBC projects. The best since independence in 1971, Bangladesh has followed friendship towards all principle. This strategy enables us to remain open to any mutually beneficial economic partnership. Therefore, all the CBC initiatives that are now ongoing in Bangladesh as driven by only economic merit and sustainable development goal. You are aware that Bangladesh has number of projects uh, to strengthen CBC initiatives. For example, we have uh, a project which is uh, being funded by the AIB to improve Silet Tamabil Road in Northeast region of Bangladesh that aims to improve connectivity with the eastern parts of Asia. AIB is also expected to join the We Care project through which road connectivity among the neighbors in the West will be improved. To support the CBC initiatives, we are also developing other facilities such as uh, land port, waterways, related infrastructure, power sector. The coverage is almost uh, 90 percent this is a very recent development we have so i think all these initiatives will pro produce the desired results we are aiming from uh, uh for from the uh, regional development and to achieve our sustainable economic development um i have one more question left that what are the challenges we face um, uh, for um, CBC, uh, CBC projects. You are right. It's not easy uh, to design a project and implement. It's not possible. Um, uh, for in instance, the foremost challenge 
I think that comes to mind to align economic of the countries that are involved in the particular CBC project. To make sure that CBC project is viable, it is important that benefit flow into um, into the directions of all participating countries. Uh, it's it's uh, uh, it should look good. It should look physical. The flow of benefit is often asymmetric, and therefore the country may not join a. CBC venture if that country is not convinced that the project will sufficiently serve its national interest. Uh, the other difficulties if there are an asymmetry in capacity of planning and implementation of the project by the partnering countries. Difference in policy with respect to safeguard national differences in standards and difference in development priorities may also pose challenge to implement the projects. So these are the uh, few challenges I think uh, we have confronted with and I have just mentioned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Fatima. It's a very good. You have covered all the points. Now let me go to Mr. Chen. Uh, Mr. Chen, ADB is uh, deeply engaged uh, with the various regional cooperation activities with, with SASAC in South Asia, CARAC in Central Asia. And uh, can, you, can you describe what's your experience and what is the role ADB is playing in promoting the regional cooperation in these two regions? Okay, yeah, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, I can okay. hear you. Yeah. yeah, thank you, VP Pandian. And also, uh, thanks for inviting me to uh, very interesting uh, discussion during the annual meeting. But anyway, uh, first of all, congratulations to the uh, sixth uh, AIB's annual meeting. Uh, very, uh, every success. Uh, yeah, yeah. So talking about this issue, I think uh, having been uh, working for the regional cooperation and the integration, uh, let me call it the RCI, uh, for so many years, I, my feeling is that uh, there uh, have no uh, uh, never been a more relevant and more challenges as you mentioned uh, VP pending uh, for the developing countries uh, in uh, in this region. So therefore, we can understand why uh, promoting uh, RCI is always the ADB's uh, uh, corporate level uh, strat uh, strategic agenda. Uh, specifically, uh, RCI has been uh, identified as uh, the one of the seven. Uh, top uh, priority uh, of uh, ADB's uh, strategy 20, uh, 2030. Uh, so under, as your question, yeah, under the RCI, including the Sussex and the uh, Carrick, ADB uh, actually play, uh, play its, uh, plays its role. I think maybe we can uh, summarize in the four areas. One is as the uh, partnership uh, facilitate a second is a project financial, financier, and uh, third is a knowledge provider, and also a, a, a capacity builder as well, which is uh, uh, very important. Uh, lots of uh, uh, successful story there as well. So let me just say a few words about them. So first of all, as uh, the partnership facilitator, uh, ADB uh, work with uh, our clients, con uh, governments, and the countries. Uh, support uh, uh, to uh, many di dimensions on that. For instance, uh, the high-level uh, policy coordinations. Uh, one uh, good example is uh, to respond to the COVID uh, pandemic. ADB supported uh, the high-level uh, dialogue, uh, for instance, the ministerial conference uh, based on the SASEC, uh, SARC, and uh, CARIC as well. So all the members uh, joined together to address uh, those issues, uh, cross cross border issues on like uh, healthcare capacity, uh, migrant uh, workers, uh, social protection and training, uh, not to mention of uh, regional economic uh, recovery uh, issue as well. So uh, this kind of cooperation uh, strongly uh, built up the confidence and the sol uh, solidarity. Uh, among the among the whole region, so I think this is a, 
a very important role ADB uh, played there. Second, uh, let me mention uh, the project finance critical. ADB support up to now since uh, the uh, Sussex and the Carrick uh, established uh, uh, in uh, 2001 supported uh, roughly uh, close to 300 Sussex and the Carrick projects. Uh, provided uh, financing about uh, 30 billion US dollars and also uh, mobilized uh, roughly uh, same uh, uh, 30 billion uh, dollars there. Uh, the things that I think uh, important is that network of cross-border connectivity uh, has been uh, uh, established. For instance, the six uh, uh, Carrick corridors and the six uh, corridors uh, is there as well. In addition, uh, not only like uh, roads, but also, as you mentioned, the railway, port, and the aviation, uh, multimodal connectivity network has also uh, uh, been, uh, been built. Uh, regarding to the knowledge provided, I think uh, this is uh, also a very uh, important area for ADB. So ADB uh, has been uh, continuously uh, scaling up its uh, TA, a technical assistant, to support knowledge sharing. Uh, some areas quite in, uh, interesting relate to the regional cooperation. For instance, the trade facilitation, uh, economic zone, a database, and also uh, many uh, uh, flagship uh, reports, uh, among others. I think this is a very uh, important area for, for, for the knowledge sharing. A specific uh, example I think I'd like to mention is the Carrick Institute is also the very good example so uh, with, uh, with that efforts, uh, training as a training and uh, research, research center in the region, I think uh, uh, pretty quite uh, uh, important role uh, there as well for this institute. Uh, last but not least, uh, as a capacity builder, so uh, as uh, Mongolia, the, uh, uh, no, as, uh, as uh, the Bangladesh colleague men mentioned as well, capacity, uh, we still have the huge gaps there so this is an area we, we strongly supported. Uh, one uh, successful example is that uh, like uh, through the newly established uh, BIMSTEC, uh, which is a seven member countries from uh, South Asia and uh, Southeast Asia, uh, ADB served as the secretary. So ADB uh, developed a comprehensive training program to conduct uh, the capacity uh, training, uh, mainly focused on the trade, transport and the tourism. Uh, so so uh, that, that's, uh, uh, I think, uh, four major area. I just uh, summarized it here. Uh, you also, uh, what, what's about the experience in the summer uh, and the lessons learned? Maybe uh, I just added a, a couple of points here. I think there uh, yeah, are too many things there, but uh, uh, first one, I think it's a, a project-based approach. I think this is a very efficient way uh, for the promoting connectivity uh, in, the, in the region. For instance, uh, uh, India came up with the strategy to uh, develop the northeast uh, region, while at the same time, uh, Bangladesh uh, has the intention to connect uh, its uh, uh, Dhaka economic zone, a uh, Chittagong zone, with the, uh, that part in the Indian side. So ADB support the road project in the uh, northeast uh, region in Indian side. Uh, at, this, uh, at the same time, I think uh, ADB and also uh, AIB jointly supported uh, the Dhaka, Silita, and uh, Tamibil, uh, the highway. So then the, 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 the both sides can, uh, can uh, link it together. So this is a, a, a very much important approach. The second I think I'd like to mention is that uh, economic uh, corridor rather than uh, just the transport corridor. Uh, this is uh, from uh, like uh, Carica side in 2009. Uh, this uh, concept uh, introduced uh, from the practice of uh, GMS uh, was the economic uh, corridor concept, I think a uh, uh, tremendous uh, uh, additional value uh, just added to the fiscal infra uh, infrastructure uh, development uh, last point I'd like to mention uh, is that uh, cross sub regional cooperation. So now we have the Sussex, we have the Carrick, we have the uh, GMS as well, Beamstack as well. But how to further 
integrated all of the sub-region is important. Uh, one area like Sasaki membership expanded, uh, including the Myanmar. Uh, uh, this is a good practice. So maybe we, uh, in the future, we need to further enhance uh, cross sub-regional cooperation. Uh, maybe let me pause here, uh, VP Pandim. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chen. I think you have very rich experience uh, in this uh, uh, region, particularly Sussex and Carrick. Of course, ADB is involved with the Asian also. I think that's a very successful example. I think we can learn a lot. I will come back uh, in the second round about that. And uh, now I'll go to Mr. Martin. Martin, you have extensive experience in World Bank and you, you are bringing rich experience by working in different countries, in Turkey, in uh, 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 and Ukraine, and now China, and also in charge of Mongolia. In your experience, uh, what are the common challenges to prepare and develop cross-border connectivity projects. Of course, I asked this question to Ms. Fatima also, but that is particularly relevant to Bangladesh, but you are bringing rich experience from different countries. If you could throw some light on how you, what you learned in your experience in different countries and what are the current challenges. Thank you. Thank you, DJ, and uh, thank you very much for this invitation to join you at the AIIB's annual meeting. Uh, we've been uh, uh, We've had good uh, sisterly or brotherly relations with the AIB since its foundation, and I'm pleased uh, that those continue to the present day. Um, I want to, uh, um, Vice President Chen just uh, uh, talked about all the things that are going well with regional cooperation and the ADB portfolio. I want to, uh, indeed prompted by your question, uh, say a few things about what the promise is but also what the challenges are. Um, and I think my conclusion is going to be that at least in the World Bank's portfolio, the evidence for actual cross-border infrastructure projects that involve multiple countries under one project umbrella with one financing agreement and according coordination of regulatory and other instruments still remains relatively rare. What we do see is regional approaches to infrastructure and connectivity investments in individual countries that may join up to an overall integrated connectivity network, but don't necessarily do so. So what is the promise? Um, and let me just give you a few statistics from our own research. Uh, very well known is the fact that, uh, for instance, in the Asian region, uh, Intra-Asian trade is only 24% of total trade, whereas in the EU it's 60%. So clearly there's upward uh, room uh, for growth. In the Asian uh, power market, uh, trade is, uh, we estimate, around four to five times below uh, the potential um, if, uh, uh, or could grow by four to five times in the next decade. Uh, if infrastructure, but also uh, regulatory measures uh, are, are, uh, are taken uh, to make regional power trade possible. And the, uh, the economic promise and also the climate promise in that is huge. Uh, if you think about uh, the importance that gas would have as a transition fuel, for example, or the importance of concentrated solar projects. Uh, but the grid integration isn't there, the grid codes uh, are not uh, compatible, uh, the infrastructure uh, is often uh, not, uh, not there. Uh, so what are some of the challenges? Uh, our research for the BRI, for example, suggests that the economic benefits of the BRI are highly dependent on actions that countries take domestically to facilitate the flow of goods and services. So trade facilitation is just as important as connectivity infrastructure. And the, there is a reason why I stress this, uh, and we may come back to this in a second round, but infrastructure is expensive. And um, a lot of our potential client countries have accumulated a fair amount of debt. Infrastructure without the corresponding domestic reforms may lead to heavy debt burdens without the required economic returns. And so what we found in the case of the BRI, for example, is that the income gains from BRI's connectivity investments are more than two times higher when they are accompanied with domestic reforms to improve trade facilitation, to improve customs, uh, to harmonize regulatory, uh, um, uh, regulatory standards, et cetera. And this is even more important when we take into account 
the fact that the fiscal space of a lot of countries has eroded to a very significant degree so that the required infrastructure connectivity, uh, infrastructure investments that we are all uh, planning uh, to, um, uh, to support um, face some very real fiscal constraints. Uh, and uh, if we are to mobilize private investments to come alongside public investments in PPP structures, uh, which potentially is a very good idea, then the regulatory environment, the security, uh, the, the, uh, the, the probability that the investments will generate a positive economic and financial return is even more important to realize those investments. And finally, a point I would make that we have uh, experience that this is relevant in the context of uh, national projects that add up to a connectivity network. We need to be conscious of the fact that the spatial effects of connectivity infrastructure are often counterintuitive. For example, we uh, made some model simulation analysis for China that the BRI could actually benefit the coastal regions of China more than the interior regions unless labor mobility within China improved. We have very similar results for Kazakhstan. Uh, city uh, agglomerations around Almaty would benefit significantly from the BRI, but further uh, remote regions in the northeast, uh, in the north uh, uh, west of the country on the Russian frontier uh, may actually lose from the improved connectivity as resources get concentrated in the urban agglomerations. And so social policies and domestic connectivity investments, uh, as well as measures to improve labor mobility, need to accompany the regional integration. Otherwise, governments may face uh, um, inequalities domestically that make it more difficult to sustain the regional integration effort. So these are some of the challenges that uh, we have found in our analytical work and in our, uh, uh, in, in, in our attempts to actually make cross-border investments under one umbrella reality. Uh, just a final word, despite all of these challenges, I'm pleased to say that these projects exist in our portfolio. Some of the best uh, known examples are the Kaza uh, uh, power trade uh, agreements and, and investments that we are uh, uh, financing between South Asia and Central Asia, uh, transport and uh, uh, connectivity investments in the Pacific Islands, uh, our work on the Lao uh, PDR transport corridor. So there are initiatives, but if you look at the whole portfolio of World Bank regional integration and cross-border investments, the majority of them are concentrated in Africa. There's a much smaller proportion of those projects in Asia. And one of the reason is some of the challenges that I earlier mentioned. So let me stop here and look forward to a second round. Of it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Martin. You brought a number of issues on table. Uh, the trade facilitation, the domestic connectivity, labor migration, project coordination. I think uh, this is really great as a number of soft issues if you want to make cross-border connectivity a real success. In fact, I'd like to point out that the TANAP is one of our first projects in collaboration with uh, uh, co-finance with World Bank, the gas pipeline all the way from Azerbaijan, Georgia, Turkey to Greece and then to Italy. It's a great project and very good amount. I think we gained a lot out of World Bank experience. Uh, the, the, uh, uh, in implementing such a big project across the uh, region, across the countries. Thank you. Thank you very much for bringing all these issues. In fact, we need to have a separate discussion to discuss about all these issues and how we can overcome these issues so that cross-border connectivity is yeah, real success. Uh, it will bring the real benefits to the people who are involved or for whom it is meant. That's the question raised by Fatima in the beginning. Now, let me go to Mr. Wang. Wang is a newly created uh, MCDF CEO, the Multilateral Cooperation Center for Development Finance. I think it is located in the AAB uh, um, building itself. It's a great pleasure to see Mr. Wang, and I will request him to give a brief idea about what is MCDF and how MCDF can support the cross-border connectivity development. Over to Mr. W Mr. Wang. Well, thank you very much, Pending, for this opportunity on a critical issue for the developing countries in an increasingly connected world and in the context of a diverging recovery from the pandemic. Um, well, also, thank you for the question. Uh, this is a good opportunity for giving a 
brief introduction of the Multilateral Cooperation Center for Development Finance for those of you who may not know much about it. Uh, the MCDF is established by 11 international financial institutions, including uh, the World Bank, AIB, ADB, and others, and uh, donors, recipient countries, in collaboration with other development partners. As a multilateral financial initiative, uh, its objective is to foster high quality infrastructure and connectivity investments through leveraging the potential for closer collaboration among international financial institutions and other development partners. I think our objective, our objective is highly aligned with AIB's mandate. So the objective of setting MCDF is to bridge the connectivity gap to finance the activities on the knowledge and the information sharing capacity building and the project preparation. It supports the implementation of the G20 quality infrastructure principles, the UN Agenda 2030, and the SDGs, and the Paris Agreement. So uh, back to the second question, how can MCDF support the cross-border connectivity development? Uh, at MCDF, we believe cross-border infrastructure investment must be an integral part of the global economic recovery. So I would like to highlight three areas we, where this financial mechanism could support. Uh, first, uh, quality and entry. I think that several previous uh, uh, panelists also raised the question. Uh, infrastructure quality should not come at the expense of quality. More than ever, it's essential to ensure the economic efficiency of connectivity projects through life cycle analysis, proactive management of the project delays and the cost overruns, and the strong governance of infrastructure sectors. When a project of high engineering, financial, environmental, and social procurement standards, it's much more likely sustainable financially and environmentally. MCDF promotes the wider application of FIS standards by new partners and the developing countries. Its grant resources will provide unique support through one-stop shop functions of information exchange, capacity building, and project preparation to achieve the SDGs and the progress on the path to sustainable economic recovery. Second, I would like to say strengthening partnership is very important. The infrastructure gap has been deepened during the pandemic crisis. Cross-border investment will strong partnership to mobilize the considerable financial resources. With more limited access to low cost borrowing, developing countries need more concessional finance. Therefore, as an independent financing facility, the MCDF will convene international financial institutions, donors, and the developing countries, as well as new partners, hunting financial resources and the technical assistance, and the leverage innovative solutions to empower shipping countries in meeting their immediate and the long-term infrastructure and the connectivity goals. MCDF's role of a collaboration platform to support joint project between multilateral development banks and the emerging market financiers offers an opportunity to work together on additional and concessional finance projects. Third, nature-based solutions. Uh, the global environmental agendas of climate change and the biodiversity are closely linked to cross-border infrastructure. On climate mitigation, connectivity projects must play an important role in reducing the energy sector's carbon footprint by connecting renewable resources with consumers. Efficient connectivity is also critical to support the net zero goals of private companies through climate smart goal, global supply chain. We have seen a lot of projects in this regard done by World Bank and ADB. On climate adaptation, cross-border infrastructure needs to be ready 
were rapidly changing climate. For example, the Panama Canal's operations are threatened by climate change impacts on the water system it relies on for its operation. The World Bank estimates that the disruptions in the connectivity transport infrastructure of Tanzania caused by rains and the floods cost the businesses 0.4% of GDP. Finally, nature-based solutions offer an opportunity to reconcile and leverage cross-border projects and biodiversity conservation as many good practices around the world have shown. The MCDF is beginning to empower developing countries for green recovery by promoting clean energy and the renewable energy with cutting edge knowledge and the financial resources that can cat catalyze the quality investment and the sustainable impact at global and the regional levels. We look forward to partnering with all of you on this important agenda. And let me stop here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ron. Uh, thank you, friends. We are running behind schedule a little bit, 10 minutes behind the schedule, so we need to expedite it. Um, uh, so my request uh, is that this, in the second round, uh, the speakers can uh, restrict their intervention to three minutes so that we will have some time for question and answer session, three to four minutes instead of five minutes. Uh, I will ask my first question to uh, uh, Her Excellency Fatima. Um, the first question is how MDBs could facilitate cross-border connectivity? How, what kind of expectation you have from MDBs like ADB, AAB, uh, and World Bank, number one. And second question is, is a specific question, so I come from one of the audience, is that uh, you need a lot of uh, power. Bangladesh is growing, as you pointed out. Uh, so you need a lot of electricity. Do you have any plan to put the electricity transmission uh, to take the cheap power or green power from Nepal, Bhutan, and India? Uh, what, what is the plan of the government of Bangladesh in this connection? Thank you. Thank you again, Dr. Pandian. Uh, for Bangladesh, you know, uh, Bangladesh is a resource -dead country, and our perspective is uh, very straightforward. The partnership with the uh, MDBs is to channel the financing for development. The relationship between the MDBs and our government is, however, not limited to financing arrangement. It is also uh, spills over to other important areas, such as uh, um, help us in designing the project, help us uh, give us the platform to dis uh, to discuss with the uh, other partners in this uh, uh, regional cooperation project. We also need their support in achieving the sustainable development goal that is not limited to one country, that is, that is the global goal. The environmental challenges, uh, the green development, which has just mentioned, the human development, uh, the climate change, adaptation, mitigation, and other areas that align the SDGs. Uh, so uh, I think the multilateral development uh, organizations, banks, they can uh, work as a catalyst, as a facilitators in developing common regional and cross-border platforms, helping countries come together on certain agenda and creating common understanding about the benefits and various other issues uh, connected with that. We would also want to discuss the global best practices, uh, which has just mentioned the knowledge uh, and uh, uh, the developments uh, 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 facilitated by the MDBs. I think the MDPs um, can be an integral part of our sustainable uh, uh, development initiatives and in this uh, regional cooperation and in the, uh, integrations effort. We are, uh, uh, we have just heard that the SASEC initiative, we are working with ADB, they are a regional cooperation and integration initiative with World Bank, 
both are working very well uh, in Bangladesh. And I have uh, mentioned be, uh, before the AIB project we have ta taken on Tamabi that is also doing very well. So we think this is the right platform for us, bringing us together uh, for having uh, the regional projects which will not benefit just one country, which will benefit the region and eventually uh, to all. So I, I conclude here. Thank you. Thank you very much, madam. Uh, Mr. Chen, there is a question from the audience. Who should play a major role, whether the government or MDBs? But I think both have their own role cut out. They have to work together. So can you throw some light on how MDBs and government can work together to make cross-border connectivity a reality? Yeah, OK, yeah. So thanks for the for the question. Uh, actually, the, the MDBs uh, are the major players in the regional uh, cooperation and the integration, but still a uh, lot of room to uh, improve. Maybe uh, in, in the interest of time, let me just uh, uh, point out a couple of them. First, I think uh, uh, we should uh, uh, join, uh, work together to, uh, to do the co-financing for uh, transformational. So this is uh, important because, uh, uh, yeah, the transformational project have uh, the larger uh, development impact uh, of uh, like uh, yeah we, we need to work together uh, in terms of uh, like uh, the the project size risk uh, the impact uh, and also the timing of uh, uh, completing uh, for instance uh, AIB uh, uh, ADB uh, ER, uh, EBRD and the office we work together in uh, ongoing the uh, Rogan bypass road that's a link to uh, from uh, Tajikistan to uh, Kyrgyz. Uh, we, are, we are going to have uh, more and more about that, uh, like a uh, TAPI project uh, uh, is a huge uh, one. Uh, due to Kosh uh, in Nepal, the hydro, uh, like uh, Kas, uh, Ka uh, Kasa railway uh, from, uh, from uh, Central West to the, to the South Asia. So those are uh, some of the very important uh, transformational project that we think we can uh, work together. Second, uh, as Martin mentioned, the regulatory issue, I think uh, the policy reform uh, is also very important. So only work for the may not uh, enough. Uh, many barriers there, non-fiscal barriers there in terms of trade, logistic as well, in terms of the performance of uh, customer services and also uh, collaboration between the two sides of the board agencies. And also the system like uh, foreign exchange uh, uh, regime liberalization, uh, tax system related to the customer as well. So like ADB, we did the project in a program uh, in the Pakistan for trade and the competitiveness in Bangladesh for Sussex a trade facili uh, facilitation program to address the regulatory issues. So the area I like to highlight is uh, the uh, recognizing the standards uh, with, with each other. So MDB uh, enjoy the same standards, uh, specifically in the safeguards, in the procurement. So, uh, but uh, uh, seems like still not well uh, mutually recognized when uh, preparing the co-financing project. But uh, one good e e example is that uh, uh, World Bank and ADB uh, jointly signed the alternative procurement agreement. So we can uh, uh, share the, the procurement uh, agreement uh, instead of everyone uh, do the same thing. Yeah, so that, that's, uh, I think, uh, we can work together. Uh, just uh, one more minute, uh, I'd like to uh, uh, mention the three areas in addition for the future. The one is uh, we, uh, we have already uh, talking about uh, promote uh, green and the sustainable uh, connectivity. So this is important many uh, instruments we can uh, introduce, like a uh, green and the blue bond, uh, so that can support the connect connectivity in terms of uh, uh, green. Uh, another one is uh, unlocking the digital potential. So this is a huge potential area. Uh, we can work together. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, the Asia uh, B2B and the retail e-commerce market is a huge. Last year, it's about four trillion. 18% uh, of uh, GDP in, uh, in Asia and the Pacific. Uh, third area I'd like to quickly mention is uh, connecting for low-income countries. Uh, the major mislinks in uh, connectivity in the corridors are related to low 
income countries. So where we need to put more efforts there jointly. Uh, that means uh, post here, uh, if you can think. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chen, uh, for your examples. And that is really, these live examples are very, very useful to understand what kind of problem uh, some of the project face and what kind of problem countries do face. Of course, regulatory issues, as pointed out by Martin and you, are very important. Unless we sort out those issues, this physical infrastructure may not be effective, as, as, as you have pointed out. Now, let me go to Martin again. Uh, Martin, uh, this, uh, what is your views that uh, after the post-pandemic, what kind of steps we should take, we should take as, as a multilateral development organizations in developing uh, infrastructure? And what are the steps needed for regional cooperation? What are the challenges mainly after the post-pandemic? Uh, thank you, DJ. I um, I just wanted to say, um, you know, with respect to what uh, Vice President Chen just said, I do think the MDBs can play a really important convening role. And, you know, we had a recent IEG, this is our internal evaluation group, uh, assessment of the World Bank's work on regional integration. And it highlights how the uh, World Bank and other MDBs have often played an important role to begin a dialogue between countries that found it difficult to talk to each other because the platform for that conversation was not necessarily there. So we can help uh, as a convener. But to make regional cooperation a reality, uh, and in, interestingly, that report is entitled, It Takes Two to Tango, we do need the leadership of the countries themselves. Without the leadership of the countries, and I was pleased to see in preparing for this session, for instance, uh, some, of the, uh, uh, some of the initiatives taken by Bangladesh and India uh, to make better use of the waterway connectivity, uh, which saves a huge amount of uh, uh, transport costs uh, by, by uh, uh, using the Brahmaputra or Jamuna uh, river that crosses, crosses both countries to, to, uh, to transport cargo. These are some of the initiatives that really can be led by countries and that's where we're going to see uh, you know, the most lasting and most convincing results. Now to your question on the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, um, you know, I think fundamentally uh, regional cooperation, the, the, the outlook on regional cooperation, the importance of regional cooperation has not really fundamentally changed as a result of the pandemic. But one thing that has changed is that our developing country clients are much more fragile post-pandemic than they were before. The recovery in the world economy is led by the high income, by the advanced countries. The developing countries in general are recovering much more slowly. Um, in, in many of the poorest countries, vaccination rates are still very, very low. Uh, GDP growth will continue to be affected by this. And fiscal space has been exhausted during the pandemic just by an effort to keep businesses afloat and basic government services continuing to function. And in that environment, we need, I think, to work with our clients to make sure that whatever projects we support are really generating strong economic returns. And it's not just any project that does this. In my view, post-pandemic, careful assessment of debt management frameworks, careful assessment of fiscal space, careful assessment of the possibilities of mobilizing private capital, and as a result, strong interlinkages between project selection on the one hand and domestic reforms to viabilize the right kind of infrastructure investments are going to be even more critical uh, if before the pandemic we could afford to make a few mistakes, after the pandemic the room for making mistakes and wasting careful or, or scarce public resources and infrastructure investments that don't generate these kinds of returns uh, is much, much less. And so I think, uh, you know, with our friends in the ADB, with the AIIB, we really need to work together to make sure we have the right frameworks to select the right projects and to advise uh, our clients on what the right policy frameworks are to make maximum, uh, to get maximum return from those projects. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much for your um, interesting answers and also in supplementing Mr. Chen's uh, views on the role MDB can play in uh, motivating the countries and also uh, preparing a, a real platform uh, for regional cooperation. Uh, now I will go to Mr. Wang. Uh, Wang, you are heading this MCDF. What are the what are the opportunities you see, and also the challenges in preparing cross-border connectivity projects? Of course, it is a very short period, 
uh, but uh, can you can you throw some light on these opportunities and challenges in preparing the project? Well, uh, thank you uh, for this question. Uh, as uh, many colleagues already mentioned, uh, there are a lot of uh, challenges ahead of the connectivity project. Uh, from our perspective, the first question, the first challenge is obviously the, uh, I mean, the funding, the funding gap. Uh, pre prior to COVID, there's still a very big gap uh, in the, between the demand and the supply. But the COVID um, already, you know, uh, accelerated the uh, situation. Um, and also, as the MIF recently pointed out, higher uh, interest rate and the lower government revenues are causing substantial challenges to low-income countries. And uh, the debt level and the physical deficit uh, remains at record high. In addition to uh, this, uh, cross-border connectivity is also facing a, another daunting challenge on the uh, environmental and social impact so usually the large uh, infrastructure connectivity investment do not uh, take sufficient into the design and the implementation standard. And uh, I would like to say now we are facing not only a COVID crisis, but also the climate crisis. So we need to deal uh, with this due uh, crisis by implementing the highest multi-dimension standards. The third challenge is about the project uh, management and the performance. Uh, there are widely exist uh, significant cost overruns and the low performance. And for example, railway project uh, exceed budget by an average of 45% for large bridges and tunnels, the number is about 35%. So the question is how to address these challenges. And, you know, uh, we, we think, uh, you know, there are a lot of opportunities and uh, uh, we need to uh, set up effort uh, in collaborating with uh, all the development partners uh, in addressing the uh, challenges I mentioned. I would like to just uh, highlight three uh, areas we would, like, we would like to do. First, the economic recovery of most of developing countries depends on the efficient movement of goods for trade and investment. Uh, we have all seen uh, how new logistical bottlenecks are causing the cost of shipping uh, to very high levels. And uh, uh, in this regard, the world needs more, not less, cross-border connectivity to maintain the economic growth. We have heard a lot of news about the ongoing uh, large connectivity project in the uh, connectivity transport and energy. And also some government already announced that must apply to upgrade uh, the existing infrastructure and the new ones. It's quite exciting, I think. Uh, second, uh, it's critical to make connectivity more efficient through system improvement on customers and the logistics, policy reforms, and maintenance and the technological upgrade for infrastructure. So those are uh, behind border policy uh, issues, but which do not need substantial financial support, but may have significant impact on facilitating the trade and the investment cross borders. So mm -hmm. this is another great opportunity to improve the business environment and other policies which are ind indispensable to the, to the success of connectivity investment. Uh, last one is the preparation of high quality project. Uh, which require good planning and adequate uh, lead time to have the thorough environmental and the social assessment. So uh, supporting high quality connectivity project is our objective. Uh, we are convinced that our mission is more critical. So um, it is time for global community to design the future with more cross-border project and the connectivity infrastructure. So we will be ha very happy to see any potential uh, in this context. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I think we are completing the second round, um, uh, but we have received uh, some few questions. I will put it to the panel uh, for their answer. They can try their, uh, try their best. Uh, uh, one question is the Central Asia. 
uh, every country is landlocked, whether it is Kazakhstan, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan is double landlocked, Afghanistan, uh, Turkestan. Uh, they are landlocked, vast territory geographically. Uh, so if you want to connect, the population is less. Their economy is small. How this cross-border connectivity project can be made economically and financially viable? And what are the challenges in making uh, this connectivity project successful in this region? I think Mr. Uh, Chen is uh, in ADB. Yeah, yeah, they're playing a very big role in CARAC. Uh, uh, I would like to pose this question to Mr. Chen. Okay, thank you. Yeah, this is a very uh, critical question and uh, also uh, we are working on that. Yeah, indeed, uh, there's uh, many, many uh, landlocked uh, uh, central uh, western countries there. Uh, for instance, the Uzbekistan is a double landlocked. So that, that's very, very challenging. I think maybe uh, kind of way, uh, uh, first uh, we need to further uh, continue our efforts in uh, regional cooperation and uh, uh, integration uh with the with the with the efforts so so still have some as i mentioned some uh, uh, mislinks there uh, mainly because of the uh, geographic uh, difficult the challenges there so this is uh, uh, the, the the efforts we definitely we need to uh, continue there to to make sure all the all the links uh, will be there year by year so we we, we are working uh, on that secondly i think uh, it is important uh, in a sense, I'm, I'm talking about not only the physical connectivity, but more about uh, uh, economic connect connectivity. So we, we need to uh, focus more on the uh, 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 comparative of uh, advantage of uh, individual countries, like uh, some countries uh, in uh, uh, Central, uh, Central West, they are very, uh, like uh, have a high advantage in uh, um, uh, the agriculture, uh, and the uh, uh, agriculture. So uh, then uh, with, with the link to each other, then the, the, the products can be uh, improved. Uh, so so that, that, that's something uh, we need to work on that. Thirdly, I think uh, maybe we need to put more efforts, uh, not only the, the, the part, uh, part, of, part of the links, but also think about uh, the uh, multi-model, uh, 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 the, the uh, transport. So then the, the whole area from the east to the Europe, from the south to the, to, the, to, the, uh, to the north, India to Russia, we can link together. All the way around, we can accumulate uh, the trade volumes together. So then the, uh, somehow uh, reduce the cost uh, and provide the trade volume so that's, that's maybe uh, something uh, we can uh, uh, work more on that. Uh, last but not least, I think uh, uh, private sector would be able to pr uh, provide a very important role in the regional uh, cooperation and the integration. So with their participation, I think as uh, a colleague mentioned, the domestic uh, uh, demands and also the cross-border demands, uh, 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 tourism, so all of those uh, would to support economically and uh, uh, efficiently. So I think th those are the, all the efforts we need to uh, uh, use a comprehensive approach. Let me oppose here, yes. Thank, thank you, thank you. The critical trade volume is also very, very important. So the cooperation of every country and sorting out the regulatory regime and the soft issues like customs and easy movement of goods and services is also will play a major role in making all these connectivity projects a really viable and acceptable uh, project. I will ask the same question to Mr. Martin uh, Reiser. Uh, you, are, you are in charge of Mongolia also. That is also a landlocked thing. and uh, uh, But a small economy. There's only 3 million people. And uh, debt sustainability is another problem. And if you want to put a railway line connecting Russia, China through Mongolia, then there's a different standards, a different causes. So how do you how do you overcome such kind of issues and such kind of problem? And what is your suggestion? It is really needed because of this problem, or if it really needed, how we can uh, do that? DJ, uh, this is a really good and very difficult question because. Uh, let me come back to our BRI study, 
what we found is that countries benefit very differently from the BRI investments. Some countries will benefit enormously. Their GDP may rise by 10% as a result of connectivity. And the main reason is they're just located in the right place. And they have certain agglomerations along existing transport corridors that will increase the benefits of being more connected to global markets. Other countries may actually find that the pure cost of the infrastructure investment to participate in some of the BRI initiatives or in some of the other connectivity initiatives may exceed the economic returns that they would get unless they take strong complementary domestic reform, uh, uh, reform measures uh, that facilitate the integration to the main transport corridors. And so I come back to the point I said earlier about the importance of domestic mobility reforms, domestic connectivity investments, and, uh, and this brings me to Mongolia, the need to be really judicious and selective in what connectivity investments you're going to support. Uh, so the economic rate of return for Mongolia, for instance, of having a double track railway from China to Russia, for Mongolia itself may be quite low. The main beneficiaries of that would actually be Chinese and Russian enterprises that use Mongolia as a transit territory. However, Mongolia has sovereign interest in controlling the railway line that goes across its territory, and Russia has uh, uh, some stakes in existing assets. So how to resolve those problems uh, is indeed what a lot of regional coordination uh, uh, initiatives are, are all about, and selecting investments that can enhance the return uh, on, corridor, uh, um, on corridor investments uh, can make a big difference in making projects viable or not. So in, in Mongolia, we've done a detailed uh, um, uh, localized study of prioritized uh, infrastructure investments that make best use of the existing spurs, but that are highly selective. Not everything that is planned should be financed and everything should be studied quite carefully. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, there is one more question. Um, you know that uh, COVID-19 has uh, made every country to realize that they need to step up their investment in social infrastructures such as health and education. Uh, education has become highly digital, so digital infrastructure has to be uh, strengthened. Health uh, healthcare infrastructure is awfully inadequate, so many countries are asking more and more help uh, to invest in the social infrastructures. So when when there is a demand for social infrastructure, like health and education is going up, where does this connectivity stand? How we can balance? I think as a government, uh, Madam Fatima, you'll be able to tell us how we are coping up this problem of demand for social sector uh, investment as well as investment for the physical infrastructure. Uh, demand for social sector development is always been here. You know, Bangladesh is still a, uh, belongs to the uh, LDC country, and 20% uh, of our population they are uh, living below the poverty line. There are development. We are poverty is reducing in the higher price, and uh, our food from World Bank can confirm that. So, demand for socioeconomic development is always there. But the COVID had changed all the plan like many other countries. First, there was a, the government priority was striking balance between the life and livelihood. That gets the uh, uh, main priority in our uh, development expenditure. But at the same time, uh, you know, to recover from the COVID, to get back to the normal level and to grow from there uh, as per our plan, this is very difficult and this is very difficult decision for uh, allocating the expenditure so far we are uh, uh, doing i think we are able to strike the balance between two the demand for uh, uh, making the uh, expenditure relate, related to mitigating the impact of covid that is getting the main priority but the health and education, they are getting the uh, priority because we need investment in health and education uh, for both 
to uh, 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 recover the economy from COVID and to take forward the economy. So I think uh, uh, there is a balance between these two. Thank you, thank you. Every every government has to make, make a balance, and yeah. that is a, that is a job. But they sometimes find it difficult, which needs a lot of uh, money. Uh, Vice President Chen, uh, you are uh, you are in charge of number of countries. So, what are the or what are the actual experience? What is the actual demand coming from these countries in South Asia, and uh, and the countries you are in charge, Central Asia, and uh, do they really? Uh, ask only for COVID-19 post-recovery or, uh, or there is a demand for infrastructure is still there and going up? Yeah, thank you. Uh, this is uh, maybe one point I'd like to make. Uh, this is related to something policy uh, decision between the short term, uh, mid term and long term. So so, so we, we always need to be able to uh, address the balance uh, among them. So uh, uh, very importantly, short termly, uh, we, we need to uh, think about because COVID is still there. Uh, government uh, and also MDBs uh, put, uh, should continue put uh, more efforts uh, in those areas like vaccines, uh, health sector, social protection. But uh, uh, yeah, how to balance that? Uh, specifically under the uh, circumstances, uh, as Martin mentioned, that the fiscal space eroded uh, during this period into account of mid-term and long-term. That means we need to also focus on the uh, projects, uh, efforts on the, on the, on the uh, connectivity, on the economic development. Uh, so so that, that's something there. Uh, so, uh, uh, we uh, need to have a, have a relatively mid-term and long-term plan as well. Yeah, so, that, so this is the point I, I, I like to make. Definitely, uh, the uh, demands uh, still remains there, but how to prioritize that is the issue. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, can I ask Martin, from the World Bank point of view, what kind of demand you are getting from countries? Actually, we, <clears throat> we still see demand for infrastructure. Um, uh, it's true that our infrastructure lending in the EAP region in our past financial year was lower than in previous financial years, and that does reflect the growing role of, you know, uh, uh, health emergency, vaccine financing, uh, also, uh, you know, direct budget support operations. But if you look at our pipeline, there's quite a robust pipeline of infrastructure uh, demand across the region. I mean, just to take Mongolia, for example, we just took a new strategy to our board in the middle of the pandemic in June. Uh, and the strategy contains quite an important shift towards financing more infrastructure. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that uh, Mongolia uh, itself, um, uh, uh, you know that or let me put it this way the the shift is really to support mongolia in the greater selectivity of its infrastructure and capex program uh, and so it doesn't necessarily mean that infrastructure investments in mongolia itself will go up but there is growing recognition of the potential value that we could provide in working with um, our client countries in helping them prioritize uh, their many uh, infrastructure uh, uh, ideas uh, to have a really robust pipeline. So I, I do think our role is still needed and I think the demand. Thank you so much. Uh, only one last question, which I'm going to ask um, for want of time. Uh, everybody can talk one minute, just one minute <laughs> or one sentence. What are your recommendations to AIIB to in fulfilling this CBC agenda? Is it, it is, is it realistic? We are supposed to achieve 30% by 2030. So what are your suggestions or recommendation to AAB as you are very well connected with AAB because we do a lot of co-finance with World Bank, with ADB and countries are our partners and also MCDF has now come to facilitate preparing a good project. So I, I will begin with uh, Madam Fatima. What are your suggestions from the, from the government uh, side? Uh, um, my suggestion will be you know, uh, to, uh, to help the countries to select the right projects based on their uh, country perspective and their country capacity. Uh, uh, and the second one will be, uh, as one of our colleagues said, to take the role of uh, uh, convener so that you can bring all the country together, show them that 
this will bring benefit for them. I think regional cooperation and integration is the uh, solution of our our development, and it gives the win-win solution to the, all the countries. So uh, the facilitator can be AIIB. Thank you very much, and Mr. Wong. You have any advice to AIB? People that you need to play a strong leadership uh, in. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, having all the partners together in the uh, project or several project umbrella. Second one is I think you need to be more proactive in gauging uh, the, I mean, other partners to seek more concessional resources to support low income countries. Because, uh, you know, uh, my understanding AIB has you know, a lot of low income country member countries. So you need to, I mean, support support them to meet their uh, consent, you no know, funding uh, demand. Last one, I, I definitely hope that you could play a very cooperative, cooperative role with other development partners by uh, leveraging your own resources. Well, thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much for emphasizing the importance and need to do projects in low-income countries. Yes, Martin, Fre Martin Razer. You know, it's always hard to recommend to others. Uh, I think we should work together. Um, I've late noted a lot of the challenges. I think we need to work together to convince governments that there, there is a big, big upside from doing the domestic reforms that would viabilize these cross-border investments. And then we need to work together to identify the highest priority investments with the best possible economic return. We need to make sure that they're designed, keeping in mind all of the safeguards that uh, Wang Zhongjing talked about. And then I think we can join hands to finance them together uh, and to achieve your goals by the end of the next uh, decade. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Vice President Chen, in 30 seconds. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah, I think uh, given the uncertainty in the future and also the new normal, so that uh, actually there. So maybe I uh, 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 yeah, advise to AIB, uh, we can uh, first of all uh, focus more on the knowledge sharing, including the South South uh, uh, cooperation. So that's uh, very much important in terms of the regional cooperation and uh, integration, specifically AIB located in the East. It's a lot of uh, knowledge generated from there. Secondly, maybe I think uh, the capacity is important. Capacity of our institution itself and also capacity of our clients. So this is somewhere we uh, still need to uh, touch high importance, pay more efforts in there. So thank you. Thank you very much. So the takeaway is working together, sharing knowledge, capacity building, and win-win as regional cooperation. I think all these are very good points. Thank you very much. If you if you do all these things, we will achieve our objective. Once again, I thank all the panelists and all the participants. It's a great pleasure for us. Your presence is a great honor for us, particularly on this occasion of sixth annual meeting. Thank you very much once for all. And thank you very much for all and all. Thank you.